Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate uh, being here. I, I want to thank David and, and Deborah for inviting me. Um, it was awesome to see the wild girls, uh, fellow Canadians. It was uh, really inspiring. And to sort of take a page out of their promotion, I have a mailing list, so I was going to pass this along. If you guys wanted to sign up, uh, we'll pass it along later. Um, I, I know you probably want to sort of hear what I have to say before you sign up, so if you sign up and you change your mind, you can come back up and we can scratch it out. So I have kind of an ambitious uh, idea of what I want to kind of give to you guys uh, this morning. And um, that is, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about the power of still photography. And I know uh, in, a, in a room full of passionate photographers like we have here, we kind of understand that. But I just wanted to remind you guys. Um, I also want to talk about taking your work to the next level. And I have some ideas that uh, I think will maybe help you, regardless of the, the passion or the genre that you work in. Um, separating yourself from the pack, something that the Wild Girls talked about and something they do very well. They're very unique. And, um, <clears throat> and ideas, for shooting your sh ideas for improving your shooting process, a little bit of technical stuff that, that might help. Um, and then people photos, getting stronger people photos. So I better get going because there's a, a lot of stuff that I, I want to talk about here. And hopefully we'll have a few minutes at the end to, to answer questions. I mean, I think we know the power of photography. And does anyone know who took this picture? Harold Edgerton. Harold, Harold Edgerton, the inventor of the strobe. The thing about still photography is um, the human eye, of course, can't see what a still photograph can do at a fast shutter speed. And there's no way we could see what I think the exposure might have been a millionth of a second. Um, still photography is unique in that form. The, the human eye can't see what, what can be done. Um, photography is a time machine. And I think that that was kind of something that I learned very quickly uh, at the birth of my son, who was like 44 days premature. And those of you that have kids, and I'm a little late to the game here, in watching the transformation of this little guy just in two years, you realize just how fast things are going. And you want to be able to sort of you know, create this kind of time capsule. You don't want to miss anything. Um, it's a powerful thing. Um, how do you photograph aging? You know, Nicholas Nixon did a project. It was really just kind of an informal thing where he photographed his wife and her three sisters over the course of 40 years. I think maybe many of you are familiar with it. And it's fascinating to really kind of look and study because you know, the still photograph is a powerful way to sort of compare and spend time with things. And, and it's really kind of a unique thing. You know, video doesn't do this. There's no other medium. That, that will uh, do that for you. You know, you can look at this Dennis Stock image of James Dean, this mythical figure. You know, was he even real? But in a still photograph, a strong still photograph like this, taken in Times Square, <clears throat> you can really spend some time and, and really start to kind of uh, go off into your own imagination. And this is, again, the power of the still. And, and some strong still photographs age really well, like fine wine. <laughs> This Ernst Hass photo photograph in the 60s, um, if it was taken yesterday, would be you know, a beautiful photograph. But it also begins to have that historical value, because you can look and you can see you know, the signage there. I noticed there's a gas station. Gas is 34 cents a gallon. I think it's up to about 43 cents now. I don't know. I haven't looked recently. <laughs> but the strongest images that we make you know, age very well you know, from a historical perspective. So the idea now that you know, millions of people, I mean, we heard it from the Wild Girls. I, I hope they don't mind me calling them that. Um, 700 million users on Instagram. More people are taking pictures than ever before. And I think that it's actually an advantage for us serious photographers. I think it's creating. Um, a larger number of us to get interested in photography because you know everyone has their phone they're they're using they're a little bit more visual savvy and i think there comes a time for some that want to go further they're limited by their phones and they want to get they want to go to bnh photo and get something that a tool that will allow them to kind of express themselves beyond what the phone the phone does so i think you know, photography is entering kind of a renaissance period. I don't look at the fact that everyone's shooting is kind of a negative and we're going to be drowned out. Because, you know, this is actually a thousand words. This is what a thousand words looks like. And I think I know and you know that a thousand words can have an impact on us. It could make us laugh. It can make us cry. It could make us change our mind. 
Um, but it takes time to go through a thousand words. It takes time to watch a movie or watch a video clip. Nothing communicates as quickly as a still photograph. Immediately, you know kind of what's going on there. I mean, you don't know the specifics, but you know this is a situation that's going on. This happened to be during the 2004 uh, political convention here in New York. But nothing communicates that quickly. And at a time when our attention spans are, are so small, everybody's got the time to interpret a photograph and get the information from it. Um, it's just that you have to make a strong photograph to be able to get the attention. And I'm going to sort of give you some ideas of, of how to do that. And it's really not hard to do. You know, we, we, we think in still images. We remember in still images. So if you look at the caption there, The Decisive Moment by Cartier-Bresson, those of you that know that photograph, imagine it in your mind. You may not see it exactly the way it is, but that's how we remember. That's how we think. And that's, again, the power of the still image. And even an image that I know so well like this, and I've, I've talked about it before. I hope there's no feedback. You know, I know this image so well, but I didn't realize that in this sort of dance poster here is sort of mimicking the puddle jumper. And for whatever reason, I never saw that. And again, that's the beauty of the still image, too. There's still surprises. There's still things that you don't see. Not everyone's going to get everything from the, the photo that you take. But it's, it's a powerful thing. And the other thing that I wanted to say is that I think in the visual arts, and this is kind of my hypothesis, that the best is yet to come. And you know, I have this uh, discussion with my cousin who manages a, a, a band in England called the Bombay Bicycle Club. Apparently, they're, they're pretty popular. And I think that you know, if you look at the young Paul McCartney, who's had this incredible career, um, he's over 70 now, you might argue that you know, maybe he did his best work you know, in his 20s when he was with the Beatles. Because there's sort of a, a raw energy of youth combined with talent that just kind of spits out this work that will ne can never really be replicated again as you age and, and, and go through life. And I think in certain creative arts, it's like that. I think music is one of them. And we can have that discussion and debate. But I look at my heroes in still photography, like Joseph Kadelka. And I look at his work. And you know, I've heard him quoted as saying, you know, he's, I think he's probably 76 years old now. He's shooting because he can. And when he gets a little bit older and he can't shoot as much, then he'll edit his film. I mean, his digital images or film, <laughs> depending on what he's shooting. Um, you know, but he's doing you know, some of the best work you know, in his 70s. And I see that with a mentor of mine, Eugene Richards, who's this incredible documentary photographer who uh, I just didn't understand, you know, how do, you, how do you take a picture like this? How do you get so close to a subject? And, and how do you, I think, as a young photographer, I wanted to know how he did it. And you know, how come it's not distorted? Because you know, with my wide angle lens, it's not going to look good. You know, I took a workshop with him. And I learned, you know, technically, he used an Olympus at the time with a 21 millimeter lens. But it wasn't about that. It's just how do you get sort of emotionally close enough to a person to be able to take a picture like this? And Eugene Richards you know, has gone back to the earlier work that he's done. And he's created some of the, the best work that I've seen him do. Um, Jay Mizell, mid 80s, always with a camera. I think a lot of you guys know him. Uh, recent work here. And sadly, we lost uh, Bill Cunningham uh, last year. But he was such an inspirational photographer on his bicycle around New York City, you know, the work ethic. So what it, really what I'm trying to say is I'm not sort of kidding myself into thinking you know, the best is yet to come. I believe that it's true, especially in the visual arts. So wherever you're at now, there are no limits to kind of what you can achieve. And because of the digital, you can actually move a lot faster and progress. So I'm going to talk about some ideas for you to progress and to use that, um, that want to just kind of keep moving forward and see how far you can take it. You know, who knows? Who knows? And photographers live a long time because we have a lot of pictures to take. I mean, you look at, you know, Karji Bassan was in his 90s, Eisenstadt was 100. So, you know, you can guarantee you'll be at least into the upper 90s if you're a serious photographer. So, as a photographer, um, when I was a kid, this picture had an impact on me because you know, it was taken at a local pool. I think I was about 14 years old. And I didn't really understand exposure and backlight. But when I looked at um, the negative, um, ask your grandparents what that is. I looked at the negative of this <laughs> image, and I, I thought to myself, wow, you know, this, 
this is better than it looked like in reality. It didn't look like this. So I realized the power of photography for me to express myself in ways that are personal and, and that I want to do. And I can use it in a, in a powerful way. I, I can sort of mold it into a unique uh, vision. And then, again, as a street photographer, and I think you know, the title is Master the Street, as a street photographer, things are completely out of your control. So if you can figure out a way to be able to react quickly and get the shot, um, that will service you well if you're a landscape photographer and you have the time with a tripod or a portraitist or whatever. So that's just a little bit of a technical thing. But the idea of taking a picture like this on a Montreal bus again when I was a kid, uh, not an easy thing to do to raise your camera and take this shot you know, without asking or without permission. Um, it's getting out of your comfort zone. I think that's another thing that we all could try and do because every time I do that, really good things happen. You know, it, it's, it's definitely worth it. So I think for me as a photographer, um, I've always wanted to, to be shooting. That was my dream, kind of living the dream. And you know, for me, I was kind of a shy person. And the camera was a way to engage with people. And you know, to the point that um, you know, people has become my most you know, powerful and my most rewarding subject. How many, I, I always ask this, how many people would consider themselves kind of shy as, at their core? Yeah. How many are too shy to actually raise up their hands? <laughs> okay, there's a few of them, yeah. And I, you know, I, I see that all the time. And I think it's because if you're shy, you tend to be a bit of an observer you know, growing up. And observing is just great training for us as photographers. And then we pick up a camera, and then our eyes are just you know, 110% open, and, and good things start to happen. So I've been doing this a long time, since I was a kid. Um, I did write this book, The Passionate Photographer. I saw a couple of people had it. I haven't read it. But it's gotten, it's gotten some good reviews. I actually have a few copies in here. But basically, I kind of explain my process. And the first chapter talks about an inch wide and a mile deep. And the idea behind that is sort of creating a set of pictures, which I'll speak to. But you know, again, when we were listening to the, um, the wild abandoned women, um, you know, the more personal you are, the more you separate yourself from everybody. You know, if I asked you what must you photograph, anyone want to tell me what they must photograph? What must you photograph? Your family, the beauty of the landscape, um, whatever it is. Everyone's got a different idea about that. But think about that. Percolate on that a little bit you know, during the presentation, and we'll come back to it. Um, this photograph by Gary Winogrand of Deanne Arbus, you know, the great Deanne Arbus, who you know, sadly kind of had a tragic life, but you know, is a very influential photographer. And she said something to the effect that the more personal you make it, the more universal it becomes. And, and that is a powerful thing, because in order to separate yourself from everybody else as a, as a photographer, you have to get personal. And the more you're willing to share of that personal, just the way you know, on social media it's going to help to, to get followers, the more your vision is going to separate from everybody else, because we're all unique in that way. So even if you're a landscape photographer, if you think about how you can be more personal about what it is that you're shooting, I think that that's going to help you and give you direction. And don't worry about, you know, this is so personal. Who else is going to, you know, photography is a universal language like music. And of course, people are going to connect to it. What do you want to say with your photography? Why do we do this? I mean, you know, people know the Vivian Meyer story. She was a serious photographer. Apparently never shared her work and you know, was discovered after she had passed. Um, you know, why do we do this? I mean, it's a lot of reasons. It's complicated. It's therapy. Um, what do you want to say with your photography? Do you want to just, again, you know, what, what you must photograph, show people what you find beautiful, what angers you, all that kind of thing. Think about that, because I'm going to suggest that you find a story or a theme. Because in my experience, creating a set of pictures is a very powerful learning, uh, a lot of epiphany can come from that. Because sometimes when you sort of spread all the pictures that you've been taking um, and really look at them, you realize that, hey, I've kind of been taking the same picture over and over again. But as a landscape photographer, how can I create a set of pictures where the viewer's journey from the first photo to the 12th, the sum is greater than the parts? And I, I use the example of Chuck Close, the painter who 
has been painting this way since the 70s. And you can look at each individual little pixel and say, you know, it's kind of beautiful or ugly or whatever. Um, but when you step back, you know, the sum is greater than the parts. There's something else that's being told. So the challenge of creating a set of pictures means that each picture has to be strong. If two pictures are you know, a little too close and doesn't move the, the story forward, you have to get rid of it. And that whole peeling of the onion as you work on that project can be a very powerful thing. And I'll, I'll talk more about that. So for me, I mean, I come from a journalistic background. I did a, a book on HIV AIDS where you know, I traveled to different countries in Africa. And you know, the challenge was to sort of create a set of pictures that in the end, I mean, I'm hoping will you know, help to inspire and help people to you know, help you know, with the cause. And, and that whole experience, I mean, you have a, a certain amount of time to complete it. And um, you, know, you do the best you can. But you, as passionate photographers, you're not working for anyone. You're working for yourself. You're your own toughest boss. So you don't have to end that project until you feel it's, it's, it's ready. But at the same time, don't be a perfectionist. You know, get it out there, share, because often that set of pictures is going to move into a different direction. So I don't want to scare you with this picture, but <laughs> I will show you a little body of work. One of the projects I do is cover, cover political conventions. And, and um, you know, it's a little bit of a, a, a stretch in terms of the uh, optic uh, uh, sort of mandate about ecology and environment. But, you know, politics is important on that, of course, too. So in the pictures that I'm going to show you, I'm going to talk a little bit about my technique. Because I think that you know, photography is like a battle between your left and your right brain. And your left brain is the logical side. It's the Dr. Spock side. You're thinking about the, the depth of the left, shutter speeds, f-stops, histograms, all that kind of stuff. And the right side of your brain is going, you know, shut up. I'm trying to take a picture. <laughs> and this kind of dilemma um, is, is, is holding you back. And, in my experience, the technical is the easiest thing to fix. It's not the most important thing for you as a photographer. Yet, there's no shortcut around certain parts of the technical. You have to find a way. If you're out there and you're focusing with your autofocus system, and sometimes what you wanted to be in focus was not, you have to figure out how to make sure what you want to be in you know, All those technical things can't be shortcutted. I think. Again, from the street idea, simplifying your process is going to allow you to, with a limited amount of left brain, um, give you exactly what you want photographically um, with a minimum of having to sort of think about it. And I don't really have time in the context of this speech to uh, speech, this talk, to, to go through the details. But I'm happy to talk about it um, later. I know many of the photographers here I've talked to have moved to micro four thirds or four thirds. Um, I'm still using my DSLRs. I still think it's kind of the sweet spot in photography. I don't mind the bigger camera, even on the street. So this kind of applies you know, for a lot of different equipment, but particularly back button autofocus with uh, DSLR. And it's a powerful, very intuitive way to shoot. Um, any back button autofocusers out in the crowd? Oh, yeah, I'm speaking to the uh, converted. That's great. Well, am I right? Yeah, yeah OK. A little more enthusiasm, but no, that's OK. It's early. Um, so back button autofocus will allow you to quickly deal with a fast moving subject by holding the button in or freeze the, the, the lock the focus very quickly. I like to stay in one priority mode. Aperture priority, I can choose my depth of field. And at the same time, I can actually change my shutter speed because as I move my depth of field, so it depends what's maybe more important. But even better, I use aperture priority in concert with auto ISO. So auto ISO, I can tell the camera, I want a minimum shutter speed of, let's say, 1 400th of a second. And I think that one of the biggest things I, I see with students, for example, is that um, if the picture is blurry a little bit, um, you know, the number one reason why a picture ends up tossed in the trash and not hung on the wall is the shutter speed was too slow. And you have a little blur. And that blur isn't helping the picture as it sometimes does by giving you the illusion of movement. It hurts. So, I can control my depth of field, but I can also have a minimum shutter speed to neutralize any coffee drinking, camera shake, or most subject movement. And I can control that. So essentially, I'm both aperture priority and auto ISO. I keep the camera not on single, but on continuous. I can still take one at a time. But when I'm moved to do so, I hold the button in, do a, do a burst. 
I turn my image review off so I don't see it popping up. I check in at times to make sure my you know, exposure and so on and so forth, but I don't want to be distracted or seduced into looking at my images. I want to be in the moment and concentrating. And live view uh, is, is a great thing to do because ultimately you want um, your camera to be like muscle memory in a way. You know, you pick up the camera. Of course, there's a few little adjustments and strategies you make before you go to shoot. But when you're in a situation, one's done, now you can concentrate on everything else. So you have to figure out a way so that the camera does not get in the way. So like riding a bike, you get on and go. Brushing your teeth, you don't have to think what you're doing. You're just doing it. And that's it. And you can trust the camera because you know, the metering system is amazing, especially if you're in RAW. You have a pillow to land on. If you over or underexpose, you'll be fine. And in aperture priority, my starting point is often wide open because you know, wide open, I'm getting the, the minimum depth of field. And selective focus is a powerful thing. Even if something's completely blown out, it still totally communicates uh, you know, what, what you, you, you wanted. You can still see what's going on. And your eye goes to the sharpest and the brightest area. So you can use that tool. Um, the other thing I do is I compose in post. Because especially on the street, um, I'd rather keep it a little loose and then finish my composition. Because I want to make sure what I want sharp to be sharp. And I keep the same aspect ratio so that in the end, even though this picture was taken far away, by the time I release it into the world, they're all the same shape. It looks like it was taken with. And just, I'm not a, a hard ass when it comes to, I like to live within the frame, but sometimes because the focus points don't allow me full coverage, I have to back up, get what I want sharp, and then I'll finish the composition. I want to squeeze every ounce of impact that I can. Um, and if cropping is going to help me, then I'm going to do it. So let me just show you this. Uh, it's a little slideshow from my work at the convention. Um, is the music, is the, is the sound on? Yeah? No? I'll just start it and see what happens. Yeah. So I'll just let the pictures run. But these were both the uh, Republican and uh, Democratic convention, and there's not a lot of time to, you got to move fast to get the shots. And I, I use those techniques that I'm talking about.
There we go. Oh, thank you very much. You know, what's exciting about doing the project is um, really kind of assembling it, because that, the editing often takes longer than the actual shooting, because you have all this stuff, you've got to spill it out, and sort of, I mean, I don't know exactly you know, what I'm saying, but I'm just putting it together in the best way I know how. So hopefully, um, in the end, um, you know, I'd like to see this sort of in book form. I'm just going to start. I'm going to send this out. If anyone so desires, they can put their email address on there so I could. Here, I'll just pass that. Some of you guys already have. Um, you know, when David Bowie passed, I, I saw this quote, and I thought it was, uh, again, very apropos for, for us as photographers. Um, if you feel safe in the area you're working in, you're not working in the right area. Always go a little further into the water than you feel you're capable of. Go a little bit out of your depth. And when you don't feel you're quite touching the bottom, you're just about in the right place to do something exciting. You know, it's going out of your comfort zone. It's trying something that you kind of want to do. So I really feel strongly that if you take on a project or a set of pictures, and I know many of you are, some of you I've seen in the portfolio review, but some ideas in terms of coming up with that story. Because once you do and you start shooting and you get a little excited, there's no getting back. You're just going to keep going further and deeper. So, you know, what are some of the common themes in your work? Obviously, people. Um, is there a group of people that you particularly admire? That could be a project. You know, when I did my HIV AIDS book, um, I dedicated it to the grandmothers who were these incredible older women, lost their own children to AIDS, and were raising these little kids, grandchildren, you know, late in life. So my, my next project, uh, which is still in, in, I'm still working on it, is, is the grandmothers, to shine the light on them. It was, it was an organic thing. Um, street scenes, you might be a street photographer. And you know you can put these things together. I mean, if you're a street photographer, your whole portfolio is sort of from the street. But your project might be you know, like Bruce Davidson did, you know, 125 Street or 38th Street or whatever street you know, has some sort of personal relevance uh, for you. Um, animals, obviously, if you want to get a lot of likes on Instagram, animals is also <laughs> a good project that you should take on. Uh, landscape work. I mean, I love all kinds of photography, uh, but you know, my passion is really on the street. I find it very challenging. Um, architecture, you know, looking up in New York, uh, there's just so much, and it could be just architectural details. Um, you might notice that you know you have a lot of reflections. You're sort of drawn to reflections, and if you have sort of you know nine strong reflection shots, that might be the impetus to go out and look for reflections. And when you go out looking for something chances are you're going to find it. If you just go out serendipitously, which is a wonderful thing, you're just going to react to the world. But when you're looking for something, you're going to find it. And then you start to really build on that. And suddenly, there's a tipping point. You're really excited about this project. What are your best photo experiences? When you look back to some of the best photo experiences you had, maybe there's a project idea there. Who knows what it might be? But why not help recreate that? Do you have special access? Sorry, I'll get that off quickly. You have, if you have special access to some sort of group or people, then you know, use that. If you know a relative that can get you in here, photog access is everything. You know, in journalism, uh, we, we say that. Um, where do you enjoy spending time? If you love spending time there, maybe there's a project idea. And because you love spending time there, maybe there's a way you'll be able to communicate that personal love of the place. Um, any kind of fun shoot ideas. Looking at some of the photographers you admire, looking at their work, OK, I'm going to replicate that idea here in New York, because they did it in you know, Poland or wherever. And then there's, of course, you know, the social issues. What are you passionate about? The camera is still a powerful tool. And like I say, still photography. Um, we all have time to interpret a, a still photo. It's just got to be strong. And if you're working on a set of pictures, it means you're going back and just getting new stuff that's replacing the old stuff, it just gets better and better. Even if you don't want it to get better, it's going to get better. And it's going to go in a direction that you can't even imagine. Keep a clipping file, a little bit old school. You know, keep a, a bookmarks of some of the things that you know, are inspiring you. you know, the old life photographers, um, you know, they had a bit of a formula, at least the editors sometimes would make sure that when they went out, you know, they had to have certain types of images to kind of round out and tell the story. The signature image, of course, is sort of you know, the best image from the group, the one that kind of encapsulates or sums up the story. We want every picture we take to be a signature image. Unfortunately, that's not how it works. But when you're working on a project, there's going to be that one image that you feel best communicates what you're saying in the whole set of pictures. It's your storefront. It's going to get people into the story. 
And then using a wide view, I mean, a wide angle lens tells more of the story. Um, so you want to sort of you know, have the wide view. And this again, you know, then there was the portrait. You had to have sort of people pictures. And this is just a rough sort of guideline that might help you with certain things. Believe me, it's kind of old school. But to round out the story. You know, and I think the more you sort of spill things out, the more you realize what you have, but also, mostly, most importantly, what you're missing from the story. Details. And each detail shot has to be as strong as any other shot. Every picture needs to be strong. And then there's the action. You know? So if you have, generally speaking, these components, you're going to get something really good. So the beauty about working on a project is you, know, you go out, you, you come in, you're not too happy, you go out again, oh, this is better. And it just gets better and better to the point where you get really excited about the project because you realize, you know what? This is getting good. I need to share this. I need to go and get this exhibited at my coffee shop, at my museum, at my whatever. But you realize you know, the best is yet to come. How far can you take this? Don't stop. See what you can do with it. And the beauty is you know, the more personal you make it, the more universal it becomes. So it's your project. You're the selfish one. I mean, it might sound pretentious to call yourself an artist, but you are. Um, you don't have to publicly say it. But you know, the more selfish you are, this is my vision, this is my idea, this is my story, the more you're willing to share of that vision the stronger the images will come. And concentrating your effort in a set is going to be, it's going to communicate more powerfully. It's going to help you. It's going to make you see things. So you know, a couple of things. I talk about shooting a volume of work. And I, I caught the tail end of Vivian's speech yesterday. Is anyone there for that? And she went on that Arctic tour. But she shoots very little. She's very sparing in terms of what she's shooting. I'm a little bit the opposite. I hate to tell you, I think I shot over 40,000 frames between two conventions. That's, you know, I need like, my hard drives aren't small ones. They're, they're big ones to, to hold all that. But I think that, you know, for me, some of it is insecurity because I'm trying to capture the moment, so I want to make sure I get it. Um, but I think that you have to go through this volume to get to the other side of, of strong photographs. I kind of look at it like, you know, you're on this roller coaster. You're shooting, you're shooting, you're moving forward, you're coming back, you're editing, you're shooting some more. You're going up, everything, you're not too happy. There's a tipping point in your work where suddenly you go out that 183rd time, and you're still in that same vehicle that was slowly making its way up, but your experience is very different. This volume that you've gone through, you've learned from it. And it's a little bit magical. And especially when you concentrate it on a specific area or project, it really does reap dividends. It's a little bit magic. That tipping point will happen. You're going to work out all the problems. The technical, of course, was the first thing you figured out, and that is no, no longer an issue. So you know, this idea of a volume, I mean, baseball players hit 3 out of 10. They're making millions of dollars. You know, what's the ratio for us photographers? You know, Cartier Bresson said your first 10,000 are your worst. Probably revise that in the digital realm, right? First 100,000 are your worst. Um, and he also said, You've probably heard this quote. You have to milk the cow quite a lot, get plenty of milk to make a little cheese. And especially when things are out of your control in sports, on the streets, um, you need to be a little more liberal, I think, in order, at least at the beginning, you know, until you're kind of mastered things and you feel confident that you can shoot less, um, when you're doing this kind of work. And the other thing is, you have to photograph different. Because if you go through the volume and you're always sort of shooting from a comfortable standing position a certain distance, your pictures are going to look the same. You have to mix it up. You have to try something new. So you got to move in closer. And I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, you know, I once, in the film days, I did a, I was a newspaper photographer, so I did a ski jumping thing. And every time the ski jump went up, I decisive moment, click, boom. I did that like 18, I looked at the, the film. Again, ask your grandparents. And my decisive moment, I missed every one. Because that moment that I thought was the decisive one, and I, the review screens on the film cameras were terrible, remember that? So you couldn't check. And I didn't know until afterward. So I've learned that sometimes that decisive moment is not my initial instinctual one. It's that moment before I sort of would, would you? You got to sort of try that. And, and that's what the volume is there for. One of the great ways to kind of experiment with this is to shoot from some sort of moving vehicle. And I love going out on these like open air tour buses. And when I was in Dubai, uh, working on a project 
I shot these all from you know, a moving bus. So things are out of your control, so you just have to sort of click and go and not think. You're not thinking. You're just shooting. And you'll look later. You're not looking at your view screen. You'll look later. And the challenge of doing this kind of thing is you'll end up um, learning a lot about, you know, and you'll be, a, you'll be able to sort of move fast. And going through the volume allows you to react fast to get what you want. And that's not going to hurt you if you're a slow landscape photographer either. So it's a good thing. And then the other thing is that going through this volume will help um, develop your style. A style is not something you create. It's something that's revealed in this volume that you do. I'm too close to my own work. I can't see my style. And I'm sure you're the same way. But I can see your style. And you probably can see mine better than I can. It's so personal. It's like breathing. It's like eating. I, I'm not thinking. I don't really see it. But it's there. And the more you concentrate this volume on a specific set, the more obvious that style will become, the more, the more you'll be able to use that style, the more you'll, you'll sort of be comfortable in terms of what is there. So the idea for a photo to become not just a literal representation, but something lyrical so that the viewer will look and go into their own world and imagine things, people that, you know, pictures that ask questions. Um, in order to do that, you've got to go through the volume. So shoot it. Shoot it and good things will come. Um, this is copyright infringement, I, I understand. Um, and you know, the other thing in my process, and it's still valid today, is you know, that volume is you've got to work it. And I call it the compositional dance, so that, that first picture is the starting point. And from there, you eye to the viewfinder, if it's a, depending on the camera, move and sort of see what things look like. Come in really close to see what things, OK? Coming really close, you know, and just and see what things look like, and you do that dance. And as you go through the and go behind, go around. The more you do that, and you come back and you say, "Oh, this kind of work. This is not what I normally do." It gets infused into your process so that you fast track to the stronger picture. So you're using this volume in a way that you're really benefiting from it. Um, so again, that first shot is the starting point. Again, for that HIV/AIDS project, this extraordinary light was coming into this mortuary. You can see. I'm not thinking, I'm shooting. It might go away at any time. So I'm shooting, shooting, trying different things. Ended up you know, using this as the strongest one. But again, that's a personal decision. The idea of shooting a volume means your editing is going to be a little bit harder. And you know, so be it. Um, you have to find a way. Um, the idea of moving in closer, I think, is a good one, too, um, because most of us, or many of us, and myself included, don't get in close enough. But the more I move in close, you know, when this shot actually happened, I sort of created it. He reacted, I reacted. But it was an authentic, real moment, albeit created by ourselves shooting. Different kinds of street photography. You know, Robert Frank, fly on the wall, William Klein, mix it up you know, with the people. Depends on your personality. But again, don't let your comfort level inhibit you from trying some things, because you don't know that. And the compositional dance, you know, again, I, some of you have heard me speak that I don't like bending as much as the next guy. But I've learned that when I bend down, I could kind of raise the woman above the horizon line, and it's a more impactful shot. And often, I will sort of start from the lower position and then have help getting up and then continuing <laughs> to shoot. And this picture, again, it breaks all the rules. Dead center, horizon line in half. but. It works, in my opinion. So the, the guides are there to help you. But as you go through the volume and start to get confident in what you think is good and what isn't, and that confidence will come. This is one of the biggest problems I see is that people, they're not sure which is the best picture. It helps to have these critique sessions. Don't let one person sort of steal your dream in any way, uh, put too much emphasis on it. But guaranteed, with the volume, your confidence in terms of your own work and knowing what you need, what's good, what needs to be better, that will come. Boldly find your camera position. You can't be timid. You, if you need to get up close, get up close. And, and that's, it's liberating, because you're, you're, you're free to kind of do whatever you want. Be mindful of the edges of the frame. The other thing that helps about pulling back a little bit and finishing that composition with the same aspect ratio is um, often I see, and you know, of course I do it too, but I see it a lot in people where they're, they're a little too tight. They're concentrating on the situation. But they're not paying attention to the whole frame. So leave it a little bit loose. You can always crop in. You can't really crop out asterisk content to wear Photoshop. 
Um, and the idea of staying in one place. You know, as a street photographer, I'm looking for visual potential and I'm staying put. Because in my experience, the more I stay, the better things get when there's visual potential there. I'd rather shoot less different situations and more shots than just move around. Because like with this puddle, I stayed in one place and you know, people were walking by, the, the advertisement was changing. It was a gold mine. I, I just didn't want to leave and I stayed a long time to get a variety of different pictures. Um, sometimes on the street, like on Fifth Avenue, I'll sort of pick a spot, I'll pick my focus. Maybe I want F8 because I want you know, more in focus. And I'll just stand there. And I'll, I'll just sort of wait and see what happens. And get all these shots. You never know what you're going to see. <laughs> I love this. Got caught. And this guy, you know, I love this guy. I used this for my card for the longest time. Um, you know, I know, I'm not a patient person, but I know that patience is rewarded in photography. And when I'm in a place, and the longer I'm there, the more I start to see, the more my surroundings feel comfortable with me, especially in travel. Um, shoot less different, more, less variety, but you know, the visual potential, and spend more time, you're going to come. What are the odds that you, you're, you're here at this moment, five-star image, you move, five-star image? Better to see potential for five-star, wait it out, and then three times out of 19 times, you're going to get that strong picture. Look for extra layers in your work. So if you're photographing the statue and then you see the bird there, OK, the bird's an extra layer. But then when it fluffs its you know, tail, that's a slightly di different lecture. You always want to try to squeeze the most out of it. Here's a, an example of visual potential, this market in Dubai. Um, I like the way the light was happening and all that. So I just kind of waited there. And there's a variety of different things and people that went by. This was the one I selected. But I'd rather spend time there, get a variety, see what's going to happen, than, than move on. Because again, that works. Moving along really quickly, I, I mentioned about people pictures. And um, you know, it's, it's difficult uh, approaching strangers. But it's something that, you know, for me, has, has been just a wonderful experience. 98% of my street photography experiences with people have been positive. Of course, there's a few negative ones. But you know, you've got to let those uh, slide off. And you have the power to sort of photograph in a way that you want. You know, the great Richard Avedon, you know, this is, one of them's by Eisenstadt, one's by Avedon. And you know, the Avedon picture, eh, it looks kind of menacing. You know, Avedon used a very simple technique, often with his portraits, white background, obviously a large format, incredible resolution. But he knew what he wanted from his subjects. And you know, he didn't care what it took to, to get it. I use this example. As they sat down in front of the camera with the knowledge they were avid dog lovers, Avedon told them on his way to meet them that day, his taxi had run over and killed a dog. <laughs> Click. <laughs> and there you go, right? So, you have the power. I mean, on the street, Bruce Gilden, you know, is an extraordinary photographer with flash, but very aggressive in your face. Not everyone can do that. He gets a very, you know, an amazing image, but that's not everyone's cup of tea. Um, but you have the power. And, you know, Cartier Bresson, and I really like this quote, it's like putting your camera between the skin of a person and his shirt. Not an easy thing to do, but to get the kind of portrait that you want. So, in that short interaction with people, I think that for me, a smile is a beautiful thing, and you don't want to not take the smile, for sure. But I've learned that often the more compelling portrait is sort of the Mona Lisa factor. So if, I'm, you know, if people are going to smile in front of me, I'll say, hey, let's try one that's serious. And often you get a more evocative image. Um, and ultimately, what you're really looking for is, even though it's posed, you want something spontaneous to happen. This guy was like, I got to go and click. You know, that was a little better. Um, you know, when I'm, I'm photographing on this project, um, this is a, an AIDS clinic, but then something happens, then it's like a much better picture. It's real, it's authentic, and again, it's the time. You know, Eisenstadt said, you've got to find the background. So what I'll do is I'll sort of compose the background with the person there, but I'm not really looking at them. I just want to make sure that the edges of the frame and so on. And once I've got that, then I can concentrate on drawing out the kind of expression that I want to get. Um, and I'll try some, you know, don't look at the camera, look at the camera. And in my experience, even in these short time spans, this is how it starts. And this is how it hopefully ends, you know, something more intimate. But it'll never start there. But here's the thing that I've learned after years of doing this kind of photography. Um, you don't have to invest that much time. Sometimes spending like six minutes is all that it takes for people to just sort of relax and allow you. And it's a bit of a numbers game. So you have you know, 20 opportunities, 
you know, we don't get five-star images as much as we'd like, but maybe two of them. But you're, you're in this for the long haul. You want to see, you know, how far you can take it and be the best you can be. So um, in ending, I do some workshops, which I'm, you know, I'm trying to promote a little bit. I thought I would show you um, some work I did uh, from Havana. How many people have been to Havana? Yeah, OK. I, I, you know it's, it's a great place for photography. There's talk that maybe Trump might you know, roll back on some of the, the, the advantages for us. But let me do this, and then we'll um, have a little time for questions. I think it's just a couple of minutes. Many of these places. Okay, well, in, in closing, I'll just say that, again, the idea of the set of pictures, hopefully that's resonating. Hopefully you're thinking of some ideas. Um, if you want to see more of my stuff, I do a few courses on lynda.com. I haven't, again, I, I wrote the book. I haven't read it. I can't watch my face for too long. But you know, some people say they get some benefit out of it. I have some street photography classes. Plus, I do a photo critique of the week there as well. And then I do workshops in New York. We have one coming up in June for the Mermaid Parade. Got one in Lisbon, Vancouver, 
uh, Japan, which is going to be amazing. Um, and uh, I'll leave it at that.